Hello, in this video we're going to look at the residuals and their properties. And first, as a reminder, we're in the simple linear regression setting, so Y follows a line plus some air around it. And this is the population model, if we knew beta 0 and beta 1 and, and the epsilon. But what we do is we take a sample of size n, and they're tuples, right, x and y. We fit a line, and then, so the, the data y follow this least squares line plus some residual. Now, why do we want to study the residual? Well, all the assumptions on this model are on the error term, right? The standard assumptions is that it's mean zero, constant variance, sigma squared. The error terms have a covariance of zero. And we could go with the normal assumptions and that it's normally distributed. You know, IID, mean zero, constant variance. So it makes sense to see if the residuals have similar properties as the population error terms. And, and we do that for model checking. So if these aren't approximately zero mean or approximately constant variance, then we know that this model's incorrect. So that's why we study the residuals. And so this is an introduction, and we'll go much more in depth in the multiple linear regression. So the residuals are E, so it's the data minus the fitted line, and we use them to check the model assumptions on the model error, this term. And as a reminder, here are the four assumptions. The mean is zero, constant variance, covariance is zero, and the fourth optional term is that the error terms are uh, normally distributed. So now let's just see if the residuals possess these properties. So we're going to go through each of these, and then we're going to, in scalar derivation, and then we'll redo it in matrix notation, which takes about, you know, four or five lines, where, where the scalar takes, you know, two or three pages. All right, so the mean of our residual, which is this, so it's y minus our least squares line, Plug in what we know about y, what we know about the least squares line. Take the expected value in, constant, constant, expected value zero. This is unbiased, so it's beta zero. This is unbiased. So everything cancels, and it is zero. So the mean of our residuals is zero. Now the variance of our residual is this. We take the variance, which is the data minus the least squares line. So then we get the variance of this plus the variance of this, and then that minus is because that's a minus, two times the covariance of each of those. Well, the variance of yi is sigma squared. The variance of our fitted line is this, and that you can look at previous video 14 for that. And this covariance is this term. And I have next video here, but really it's page uh, three is when we're, we're going to look at this. So we combine all these and we get this quantity here. So the variance is not a constant sigma squared, right? It depends upon the xi, so it's a non-constant variance. But one, a couple notes though, um, of course the variance depends upon xi, so it's not even constant. But as n goes to infinity, meaning we gather more and more and more data, this goes to zero, and x i is a fixed point. This, you know, on average goes to mu, so the top goes to a fixed point, but the s x x is goes to infinity. So these two terms go to zero as n goes to infinity, and then um, so that means in limit. The variance of epsilon or our residuals is sigma squared, so it is constant asymptotically. And so, and then we say for large n, it's approximately constant. So, the larger a sample size we take, then the better that residual will resemble the population error term. So, let's look at the covariance. So, the covariance um, between any t two residuals now. I'm going to have to go back to previous video three 
where we rewrite the least squares estimates in terms of this and beta zero is in terms of this where that's the air term d is is this uh, constant term that's a, the same constant sxx is of course the sum of the xi minus x bar quantity squared All right so we're, when we plug in for the residuals we're going to make use of this but the fitted line is beta zero hat plus beta one hat xi so we can take these and rewrite the fitted line like this so this is the fitted line but then beta zero if we plug in what we know here so that beta zero is there the sum of the epsilons divided by n that's this because we factored out a sum the x bar is here the d is here because it's in both of those and you kind of you kind of see where we use those for the fitted line and we got this now let's look at the covariance and we write it like this and then we plug in what we know so y is to the epsilon or the yeah to the epsilon and then the fitted line is this that that now the next step I skip a few steps because in the covariance constant terms go away so that goes away this goes away goes away goes away and then when we plug in what we know for this fitted line which is this right these constant terms go away and so that just becomes this and the same for this but notice that you know we have a J and we have an I that corresponds to the I and J now here it gets a little messy but essentially when we take the covariance between the, any two epsilons it's zero so that goes away and then we take the covariance between this epsilon i and this sum whenever this is not i it's zero so there's only one term in here where it's not zero it's, it's when it's i and then the covariance between epsilon i and epsilon i is sigma so it would come out front and that's why we get this the sum goes away because it's only one term so we get that constant term and the sigma out front in the same way here there's only one term here the epsilon j that this is not zero and that's where we get this term here notice that the i is there and then when we did this that the j is there now this term is it's a double sum so whenever they're not the same it's zero so when they're the same it's not and that's how we get this so it's a sum from one to n and the sigma you know the because of the sigma comes out it's a constant and then we have this double product here right um, I may be going a little fast but you can pause the video and, and, and go through that so these two terms come to here these two terms when you plug in D go to this one the sum of 1 over n is 1 over uh, oh, the product of 1 over n times 1 over n is 1 over n squared the sum we get this and then when you do that you, you end up with this now the sum of the dk's is 0 this is 0 this is 1 over at uh, sxx so then those go away this can be combined with that that can be combined with that and we get this okay so now this is but we wanted the covariance to be zero and that's not zero but as the limit of n goes to infinity this is zero so as n gets large this goes to zero and these are fixed points up there and when it go in we keep adding data this goes to infinity which makes this go to zero and the whole thing goes to zero so it is zero and so then for large n we can say that the covariance between any two residuals is is pretty close to zero and then we can show that the residuals are normally distributed so if this is the residual it's why i minus the fitted line but we showed in pv14 that the fitted line is a linear combination of the y's you know the, but when when we go from j equals one to n when we get to i we can bring that in there and then just kind of rewrite it as ci j star and when they're not equal then it's just minus ci which is the minus ci and then 
when they're equal means otherwise, then it's 1 minus ci. So it is a linear combination of the y's, which means it's normally distributed, right? And, and so it has a mean of zero, a, a, asymptotically a mean of zero and a constant variance. All right, so this is the start of the, it would have been the next video, but I just thought, let's put them all together. And so this is background that I would have explained the population, the sample. Um, and I just wanted to cover a loose end from a previous video, redo the calculations of this covariance between YI and Y hat. And from PV17, we know that, you know, we could write the fitted line, you know, using these, right, where it's this. So we already covered that. So the covariance between these two, you plug in Y, and then you plug in this fitted line. Constants go away, and um, the only term, so when this is not I, it's all zero. So there's only one term that's zero. It's when it's I, right? Well, that sum comes out front. So this is the variance of sigma squared comes out front and we get this. Anyway, I just wanted to quickly go through that. Really, I want to introduce matrix notation. I want to do all these calculations again, and it takes four or five lines. It is so easy. So one, two, three, four, five, six lines. Um, and and really, this you need to get this in your mind. And so I'm going to go over it in matrix notation, and your homework is to absolutely do all these matrix multiplications to make sure that they equal to the formulas that we just got. And that's going to be critical that you understand that when we get into multiple linear regression. And so I want to redo this, um, this video, this PV17, using matrix notation. So the residual is YI minus the fitted line. That's from I equals 1 to N. But we have to write it in matrix notation. So this is a vector. So the first component is E1, E2, all the way to EN. This is YI, Y1, Y2 to YN, the fitted line. So that's Y1 hat, Y2 hat, all the way to YN hat. So these are vectors, and, that, and this represents this. Now, PV8, previous video 8, we showed that the fitted line is actually H times Y, where H is this. And it's called the hat matrix, because when you take h times y, it puts a hat on y, right? Th th these equal. But now there's a y common in both, so we can factor it out. We get the identity minus h times y, okay? So this is the residual in matrix notation, and, and it'll be second nature for us in multiple regression to go, oh yeah, that's residuals. And then we can easily do properties from this using quadratic for, uh, forms. All right, so the expected value of the residual is this, and y is the only constant, so it comes in. But the expected value of y is actually our fitted model, so it's x beta. But in previous video 9, we showed that x times this is 0. And so do that math. So now the variance, and we're almost finished is this. So the variance of epsilon is this. Now when you take the variance of matrices, you have to pull that out front and it goes out back transposed. So we get this. The variance of yi is sigma squared i. That's a constant, so it can go out front, and that's i, so we just get this. Now in previous video 8, we showed that i minus h is symmetric and idempotent, so we just get this product back. And this is it. This is, We're done. This is the variance covariance matrix of, of epsilons. And so when you multiply this out, you're going to get every, every result that we did in the first three pages. It's amazing. And I recommend that you do it at least once in your career. So to show it's uh, uh, normally distributed, remember this is, Eps or this is our uh, residual. And where y is multivariate normal x beta sigma squared i, so that means that it is normally distributed, and the mean of this was zero, and the variance was this. And so it's multivariate normal with mean zero than that. 
Now, very briefly, the residual, of course, is EI. And for large N, that means that approximately or asymptotically, they are IID, normal zero sigma squared. A standardized residual is we take the residual and divide it by the uh, standard error. So this is the square root of the mean square error. And it and then asymptotically it goes to standard normal. Now a studentized residual is the residual divided by its standard deviation or the square root of the uh, variance. And as a reminder, let's where is the variance? So we calculated the variance earlier, which was this. So when you divide the residual by its variance, it's also uh, approximately normally distributed. And actually, this is close. This is closer to normal standard normal than this is. But asymptotically, they're both the same. So very quickly, uh, why do we analyze residuals? It checks the validity of the models, and also we're going to use it to check outliers and what's called influential points. And we'll cover this more in depth in the multiple linear regression. Well, that's all I have for today. Hopefully you enjoyed that. I sure did. Please like the video and subscribe so you don't miss the next one. Thanks. Bye.